and support for each of us. Now I invite her to give a brief introduction of the program and deliver the welcome address. Principal of the college, Dr. Vargis Mathisa, keynote speaker of the day, Dr. Indulal Ji, participants from different parts of the country, and my dear colleagues. It gives me great pleasure to extend a warm welcome on behalf of Dr. C.T. John Research Center for Mathematics, Marthama College, Tiruvella. The Research Department of Mathematics organized this research oriented lecture series with the intent of promoting active and interactive learning. We wish this lecture series will enable you to enrich your knowledge. Our principal, Dr. Vargis Mathisar, is with us. He was the former head of the Department of Mathematics. Because of his continuous support and guidance only, we are able to conduct a webinar like this. With great pleasure, we welcome you, sir, to the online lecture series. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Indulal G, Associate Professor and Aloysius called He has done his research in studies on the spectrum and energy of graphs from Cochin University of Science and Technology. Dr. Indulal is the referee for various journals and approved reviewer of American Mathematical Society. Indulal sir is also the member of American Mathematical Society, Kerala Mathematical Society, and American Chemical Society. He has more than 15 papers in referred journals. Also, he, he has presented research papers in seminars and symposia held in different parts of the world. On behalf of Marthoma College and all the participants, I extend a warm welcome to you, sir. Today, we have with us teachers from different colleges, research scholars and PG students. We welcome all of you to the online lecture series. I also appreciate the organizing committee members for coordinating the program and welcome you all to this lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Miss. Without the able support and leadership, of our principal, Dr. Vergis Matthew, this program would not have been a reality. I'm happy that he is gracing the occasion and I gladly invite him to deliver the principal's address. Today's chief guest, Professor Dr. G. Indalal, St. Aloysius College, Arutua. Professor Minnie Thomas, Arutua Department, Professor Anu and James, convener of this program. Organizing committee members, Professor Redish, Professor Manesh Jacob, Professor Preda Rachel George, Research College, teachers from various colleges, students, and other participants. Greetings from Martha Makolai Thiruvalla. The Department of Mathematics, Martha Makolai Thiruvalla, offers UG, PG, PhD, and one certificate program. The department has a full fledged research center, Dr. C. T. John Research Center for Mathematics, named after the former faculty of the department. So far, the, the research center has produced 16 PhDs. Now, 11 scholars are pursuing their PhD program in mathematics. Every year, we conduct Professor C. Kochiman Memorial Endowment Lecture. Dr. C. T. John and Professor C. Kochiman of the department has initiated the formation of the Kerala Mathematical Association. COVID-19 pandemic has affected all our activities. Only alternative for education sector is classes through online platforms. Recently, the Department of Mathematics has organized two major activities. First one was online three-day national lecture series on graph theory and its applications. Professor S. Anubugam was the resource person. Second one was a six-day international workshop on initiation to linear algebra. It was from 28th September to 8th October 2020. In continuation to linear algebra workshop, now we have another research-oriented lecture series. 
we are planning to conduct two or three lectures in a month per on this lecture series. The aim of the lectures is to introduce new research areas in discrete mathematics, especially graph theory. Today we have an, an important person with us, Dr. G. Indula. He is from St. Lucius College, Yarpo. He got a PhD degree from Kochi University of Science and Technology under the guidance of Dr. A. Vijay Moore. He has several publications. He is a member of PG Board of Studies in Mathematics, Mahatma Gandhi University, Kote. He is an orator and encouraging mathematical education. Dr. Indilal is an expert in the field of spectrograph theory, which uses the tools of linear algebra. On behalf of Martha College community, I welcome you, sir, to Martha College Thiruvan. I congratulate the Department of Mathematics for the, this new initiative. Participants of this program are our source of inspiration. I welcome all participants to Martha Makoli Thiruvanna. I am very sure that, that the research or the lecture series will be a platform to learn new areas in discrete mathematics. I wish all the participants a nice experience. Hope the discussions and deliberations will generate interest towards spoken theory. Wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next, we move on to the first session of the lecture series. Before that, I would like to inform that the second session of the series will be conducted on Saturday, 17th October, and the link for the same will be sent later. We are extremely pleased and honored to have the understanding of the topic. I invite you, sir, for the talk. Okay, thank you very much for the remarks. And at the outset, let me thank the organizers, especially Dr. Varghese Matthew, Principal, Marthama College, Thiruvalla, for inviting me to give a lecture on this prestigious C.T. John Memorial Lecture Series. And during his presentation, he remarked that there are several milestones already initiated by the Department of Mathematics and Marthama College, Thiruvalla. And I congratulate all the team members behind this organization. And once again, thank you very much for inviting me to this lecture series. And I assume that all participants have a graph theoretical background. And even though they do not have, I suppose they have a linear algebra a basic background. The last week, Matama College Thiruvalla conducted a workshop on linear algebra. And this topic, this uh, lecture on spectral graph theory uses plenty of linear algebra tools. And without the linear algebra, we cannot have discussions on spectral graph theory. So we assume. Either you have a graph theoretical background or linear algebra background. As all of you are aware that this graph theory is, a, is evolved as a branch of mathematics in, in the 18th century. And I avoid the cliche statement that uh, due to the work of Euler, Leonard Euler on the famous Konigsberg bridge problem. And after its evolution in the 18th century, graph theory became dormant for about uh, that century. And initiation of its development started only in 1860s and later on 1890s, etc. And this branch of mathematics, spectral graph theory, evolved around the 20th century in the early 1940s. The first paper on uh, graph spectra, a spectrum of graphs, or a 
or a paper related with the spectrum of graphs appeared in 1936. And in that paper, the chemist E. Huckel uses some spectral graph theoretical concept to describe his Huckel molecular orbital theory, uh, particularly related with the energy of the molecule saturated hydrocarbons. And it took around 21 years later only. So it took 21 years for a mathematical paper on spectra to appear. The first uh, mathematical paper on spectrum of graphs appeared in 1957 and due to the work of Sigovitz and Collatz. And now it is 2020 and around 63 years have been passed. And during these 63 years, more than 15,000 research articles have been published in one aspect or other dealing with the spectrum of graphs. So this is actually an ocean of uh, research results. So those who want to pursue or to initiate research, this is an ocean of results. So that one can attempt or continue or do some research on already established results, generalizing it, deviating that from the normal approach, so and so. So that is why the spectral graph theory is a significant area of research. And as the name suggests, I would like to talk with you by sharing some information regarding the spectrum of graphs. See, I am not going into the core level at the first lecture. Instead, I would like to give you a very, very elementary level talk, elementary level information sharing with uh, discussing the tools we are applying in this study of spectrum of graphs. As I already suggested, we use plenty of linear algebraic tools in this discussion. And we start with very elementary, at a very elementary level. Okay, is the screen visible? I can't see the chat. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So we begin with. See, usually members of RN, the Euclidean space is denoted by the ordered n tuple x1, x2, x3, etc., etc. And in our discussion, we use, we denote the members of RN as n by 1 column matrices. So that x is a member that is represented as an n by 1 column matrix. And we define dot product of two vectors. Some members of Rn are called vectors because Rn is a, a well-known vector space. Members of Rn are n by 1 column vectors. And dot product of two vectors is defined as See if x is equal to x1, x2, etc., xn. And y is equal to y1, y2, etc., yn. The dot product x dot y is defined as x transpose y. So this is sigma i from 1 to n x i y a. And x dot x, that is sigma i from 1 to n x i square. So that this is never zero if x is not zero. And two vectors are said to be orthogonal if their dot product is zero. And the linear independency of vectors follows from basic linear algebra. And two orthogonal vectors are always linearly independent. So if u and v are orthogonal, 
u dot b equal to zero and if you consider a linear combination alpha u plus beta v equal to zero taking dot product with v alpha u dot v this will be zero and beta v dot v equal to zero that implies beta equal to zero consequently alpha equal to zero so orthogonal vectors are linearly independent <coughs> And actually, this is the place where linear algebra comes into the theory of graphs. A non-pictorial representation of graph is affected by an adjacency matrix, by, a, by means of a matrix. See, there are several matrices associated with the graphs. Even though the initial one which started during the work of Huckel on is molecular orbital theory was the adjacency matrix of the corresponding molecule or the corresponding graph. There are more than 95 matrices now associated with the graphs. Adjacency matrix, distance matrix, Laplacian matrix, signless Laplacian matrix, signless distance Laplacian matrix, complementary distance matrix, reciprocal distance matrix, cycle matrix, block matrix. And whatever concept you meet in graph theory, that can be converted suitably in terms of a matrix. So that is the practice actually now going on uh, in the research area of graph theory. And a non-pictorial representation of graph is affected by a matrix and the adjacency matrix is defined by, there is an n by n matrix. If, we, if G is a graph, if G is a graph on vertex at V1, V2, etc., Vn, then the adjacency matrix A is defined as an n by n matrix whose ijth entry is 1 or 0 according as VA is adjacent to VJ or not. So actually this adjacency matrix then reflects the adjacency relation in the graph. We can construct the graph from the adjacency matrix and vice versa. So this is this serves as an efficient tool for inputting a graph into a computer and for uh, machine software works. Now, that is a, this is a natural question that the labeling of vertices has something to do with the adjacency matrix. Because we defined adjacency matrix with respect to a particular labeling and the ij entry is 1 or 0 according as that particular under that particular labeling VA adjacent to VJ or not. Let us see what happens if we Interchange, interchange two labels, say 1 and 2. See in this graph, this is K12, vertices are labeled 1, 2, 3. This is, the, this is also K12 with vertices labeled 1, 2, 3. Whereas we interchange the labels 1 and 2 in the second graph. And how this interchange get reflected into the adjacency matrix? See, we can see that for the first one, this is okay. So these there was these rows and columns are indexed by vertices. And in the second adjacency matrix, second adjacency matrix is adjacency matrix of K12, but at the first look they are different. And what happens actually is when we interchange the 1 and 2, 1 and 2 designated with uh, first row and second row, first column and second column. Now in this Second adjacency matrix. The first row and the first second row get interchanged. So zero one zero. So this happens first. First, first and the second rows get interchanged. And these are indexed by columns also. So these two columns get interchanged. And this again. These two first and second columns get interchanged, and that results in 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And we can see that that is the next second adjacency matrix. And from elementary matrix theory, we see that interchanging of two rows is an elementary transformation, interchanging of two columns is an elementary transformation, and a matrix obtained from another matrix using elementary transformation is similar. So what we are getting is a similar matrix. So if under one labeling, if A is an adjacency matrix and in another labeling, 
B is an adjacency matrix, then A and B are similar. Here we applied interchange of two labels, and you now you consider a general shuffling of this labeling. So that V1, V2, etc., Vn get changed, labeled to U1, U2, etc., Un. Then in algebra terms, this is a permutation. And we know that every permutation is a product of transpositions. So this is a product of transpositions. And when this product of transposition is applied on this matrix, at each transposition, two elementary transformation will happen. Interchange of two rows and interchange of two columns. So consequently, this product of transposition results in a series of elementary transformation in the first adjacency matrix A. And at last we get B and A and B are similar. So if we are interested in studying the properties of matrices which are invariant under similarity, labeling is insignificant. I repeat, if you are interested in studying the properties of matrices, which are invariant under labeling, which are invariant under similarity, then this labeling is insignificant. And in spectral graph theory, we are interested only in those properties which are invariant under similarity. So no problem. So uh, you need not stick on a particular labeling. You can label the vertices in any way as we wish. We, what we get is the adjacency matrix. And if somebody get another adjacency matrix, then both these are adjacency matrices are similar. Okay. And adjacency matrix keeps similarity under vertex labeling. And one of the most interesting fact is A is real and symmetric. A is real because the entries are only 1 or 0. And the matrix is symmetric because a i j depends upon whether v i and v j are adjacent. So that is the same as a j i. If v i and v j are adjacent, v j and v i are adjacent on the other way. Otherwise, they are not. So a i j is equal to a j i and that is symmetric. See, actually, this is an advantage of uh, you considering this adjacency matrix. Then we have plenty of results concerned with the symmetric matrices in matrix theory in linear algebra. And we can use all those results available in linear algebra to study the properties of the adjacency matrix. And another interesting observation, see the raw sums to degree, that is trivial, because corresponding to one row, VI, see the entries coming along that row is, if, some, if somebody is adjacent to VI, the entry will be one and elsewhere zeros. So how many ones are there? There is a total number of vertices adjacent to VA. So this row sums to degree of VA. It's very trivial. Now another observation is, IJ entry of A raised to K is the total number of VA, VJ walks of length in G. And actually, you see, you see this result. A is the adjacency matrix of a graph G. And this matrix is a, a, another language representation of G. And this results then this result then gives a structural relation or structural property of the graph in terms of the corresponding matrix. So actually, the total number of VA, VJ walks. See, walks is a structural property of the graph. The ij entry of A raised to K is the total number of VA, VJ walks of length K in G. And the proof can be seen in any elementary graph theory textbooks. And for the completion, for the sakeness of completion, let me uh, sketch the proof. So for K is equal to 1, the result is very trivial because the ij entry of A raised to K, A raised to 1, that is A, that is AIJ. If VA and VJ are adjacent, then the number of VI, VJ walks of length 1 is 1 and 1 is AIJ. If VA and VJ are not adjacent, then there is no VA, VJ walk of length 1 and the corresponding entry is 0. And that is the total number of VA, VJ walks of length 1 in G. 
and assume that the result is true for k minus 1 so that the ij entry of a raise to k minus 1 say matrix bij is the total number of vi vj walks of length k minus 1. and a raise to k let it be cij and matrix cij is equal to then matrix bij into matrix aij where cij is sigma h from 1 to n b i h a h j we consider one term b i h into a h j b i h is the total number of v i v h walks of length k minus 1 and a h j is the total number of v h v j walks of length 1 so the total number of v i v j walks of length k passing through v h is b i h into a h j and as h runs from 1 to n this gives the total number of v i v j walks of length k in g and by induction then the result follows we define the eigenvalue let's say see, this is the conventional definition of an, the eigenvalue and eigenvector if a is a matrix the lambda is an eigenvalue of a if and only if there is a non-zero column vector v such that a v is equal to lambda v and the set of eigenvalues of the graph or the corresponding matrix are the roots of the characteristic polynomial determinant lambda i minus a and the set of eigenvalues forms its spectrum Regarding a, a graph, we see that the adjacency matrix is symmetric and real. Then we can see that the eigenvalues are real. A is real, so A conjugate is A. A is symmetric, so A transpose is A. So suppose lambda is an eigenvalue of A with an eigenvector V, so that AV is equal to lambda V. Then lambda V bar transpose V is equal to v bar transpose lambda v this is v bar transpose see this lambda v is a v this is v bar transpose see this a can be written as a conjugate because a conjugate is equal to a and this a conjugate can be written as a conjugate transpose because a conjugate transpose is a itself v and this is a conjugate, V conjugate, the all transpose V. And since A V is equal to lambda V, A V, see, and this is A V, the all conjugate transpose V. A V, the all conjugate is equal to lambda bar V bar. So this is lambda conjugate, V conjugate transpose V. And we started with lambda v conjugate transpose v and we ended with lambda bar v conjugate transpose v and v is non-zero because v is an eigenvector and v bar conjugate v is equal to sigma i from 1 to n v i bar v i if v is equal to v1 v2 etc v n and this is modulus of v i square so this is sigma i from 1 to n modulus of v i square that is never zero because v not equal to zero and from this equation then lambda equal to lambda bar or lambda is equal to lambda conjugate so eigenvalues are real so the eigenvalues of a graph are always real and another observation is this is also from elementary linear algebra for every eigenvalue lambda of a f lambda is an eigenvalue of f of a for any polynomial f x. See, we use these 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 results in discussing our major results later. See, consider any polynomial f x. See, suppose f of x is equal to a n x raised to n plus a n minus one x raised to n minus one plus etc. plus a naught a one x plus a naught be a polynomial in x. Then is given lambda is an eigenvalue of a so there is a non-zero vector v such that a v is equal to lambda v v not equal to zero 
that for a square v is equal to a of a v this is a of lambda v this is lambda of a v because lambda is a scalar so this is lambda of lambda v and this is equal to lambda square v so reasoning inductively we can we have a raised to tv is equal to lambda raised to tv for all t 1 2 3 etc now f of a is equal to an a raised to n plus a n minus 1 a raised to n minus 1 plus etc plus a1 a plus a not i and when we apply v on both sides f a of v you can see that an a raised to n v a raised to n v is lambda raised to n v plus a n minus 1 etc a1 lambda v plus a not v so v is taken outside what happens is then v is taken outside so this is of v and this is nothing other than f lambda f lambda v. so for any eigen lambda of a f lambda is an eigen value for any polynomial f of x is an eigen value of f of a for any polynomial fx. And this is another interesting observation regarding the eigenvalue of a graph. The algebraic multiplicity of an eigenvalue is equal to its geometric multiplicity. See what is meant by that? The algebraic multiplicity, the algebraic multiplicity of an eigenvalue is the number of times it appears as the root of the characteristic polynomial. And associated with an eigenvalue lambda, there are eigenvectors. There may be more than one eigenvector. The number of linearly independent eigenvectors associated with the lambda is known as the geometric multiplicity of lambda. The algebraic multiplicity is the pure algebraic multiplicity, that is, the number of times lambda appear as the root of the characteristic polynomial and associated with lambda there are eigenvectors and the number of linearly independent eigenvectors or the dimension of the space spanned by the eigenvectors and that space is known as the eigen space so the algebraic multiplicity is the dimension of the eigen space associated with the lambda and since a is a symmetric matrix we can see that the algebraic multiplicity of an eigenvalue is equal to its algebraic uh, algebraic multiplicity is equal to its geometric multiplicity. So if lambda appears as the root of the Garrison polynomial k times, then there are k linearly independent eigenvectors associated with that. So suppose lambda 1, lambda 2, etc., lambda k are k distinct eigenvalues with multiplicities m1, m2, etc., mk. Suppose lambda is an eigenvalue of multiplicity k. Now we see that A is the matrix Aij, that is the adjacency matrix of G. And we can see that or we can consider this A as a linear operator from Rn to Rn. A can be considered as a linear operator from Rn to Rn so that the basis of in some basis, say u1, u2, etc., un of Rn, the matrix of A is A itself. So that A, A ui is equal to A i1, u1 plus A i2, u2 plus etc. plus A i n, u n. Now it is given that lambda is an eigenvalue with the multiplicity k for G. So there is a non zero v1, non zero vector v1 such that lambda a v1 is equal to lambda v1 v1 is non zero so if you take v1 alone that is linearly independent and consider the space capital 1 spanned by this v1 alone and capital v2 that is a collection of all w such that w orthogonal to v1 Since Rn is having an orthogonal basis, Rn can be then written as the direct sum of V1 and V2, say elementary linear algebra. 
now we can show that this a can be a restricted linear operator from v2 to v2 so this is because so suppose w belongs to v2 therefore w transpose v1 equal to 0 we can show that the aw also belongs to v2 you take the dot product of aw with v1 aw v1 is w aw transpose v1 that is w transpose a v1 this is w transpose a v1 is lambda v1 lambda is a scalar so lambda w transpose v1 and this is zero this is zero means a w is also orthogonal to v1 and v2 is the collection of all vectors which are orthogonal to v1 so a w also belongs to v2 so a can be now considered as a restricted linear operator from v2 to v2 the same argument applies now lambda is the root of the characteristic polynomial k minus 1 times when we considered a as a linear operator on v2 then associated with this v lambda there is another vector v2 not equal to zero in v2 that means orthogonal to v1 such so that a v2 is equal to lambda v2 now we replace the argument by changing v1 to the space span by v1 and v2 and v2 that is a collection of all w which are orthogonal to v1 and v2 the same argument applies till we extract so the same argument will apply till we extract k linearly independent eigen vectors k linearly k orthogonal eigen vectors and we already showed that orthogonal vectors are linearly independent so this process will continue till we get k linearly independent or orthogonal eigen vectors associated with lambda whose multiplicity whose algebraic multiplicity is k see from this stage the occurrence of lambda ceases occurrence of lambda stops so the occurrence of eigen vectors associated with the lambda also stops so if lambda 1 lambda 2 etc lambda k are k distinct eigen values of the graph with the multiplicities m1 m2 etc mk then m1 plus m2 plus etc plus mk equal to n n is the number of vertices of the graph or order of the adjacency matrix then here we showed that the algebraic multiplicity k is equal to its geometric multiplicity by systematically constructing k orthogonal eigen vectors associated with the lambda and if we if we generalize this then corresponding to lambda 1 with multiplicity m1 we get m1 linearly independent eigen vectors and corresponding to m2 we get m2 linearly independent eigen vectors which are in fact orthogonal to the already chosen m1 linearly independent or m1 orthogonal eigen vectors all these are orthogonal because whatever we are choosing we are choosing a new vector new vector from in the space orthogonal to the already constructed va so at last the construction ends with mk linearly independent eigen vectors associated with lambda k so in the in the n dimensional space rn we get m1 plus m2 plus etc plus mk which, which is n linearly independent eigen vectors they are linearly independent they are they are not only linearly independent they are orthogonal also so we get so uh, this this set of n linearly independent eigen vectors consisting solely of the eigen vectors of the graph constitute a basis for r and this is a, a, a something a strong result in speckle graph theory given a graph g the eigen vectors of g constitute a basis of r and we can see that 
in that basis is suppose suppose lambda 1 lambda 2 etc lambda n be the eigen values with uh, actually in fact with the multiplicities see some lambda 1 and lambda 2 may be the same and v1 v2 etc vn be the orthogonal basis formed by the eigen vectors of this lambda 1 lambda 2 etc lambda n then we can see that av1 is equal to lambda 1 v1 av2 is equal to lambda 2 v2 so this is lambda 1 v1 plus 0 v2 plus etc plus 0 vn and this is 0 v1 plus lambda 2 v2 plus etc plus 0 vn and at last a vn is equal to lambda n vn and this is 0 v1 plus etc plus lambda n vn so that the matrix of a so that the matrix of a in this particular basis b is equal to lambda 1 0 0 etc 0 lambda 2 etc 0 0 lambda 3 etc etc lambda n so given a graph g rn has a basis consisting of eigen vectors of g and in that basis matrix of the adjacency matrix is a diagonal matrix and moreover the diagonal entries are the eigen values of the graph so if we call this as say d then a is a similar to d similar matrices are the same spectrum and they share several common properties and this is an algebraic result every symmetric matrix is diagonalizable and this is how every symmetric matrix is diagonalizable and the adjacent symmetrix is similar to a diagonal matrix in some basis and particularly that basis consists of eigenvectors of g and advancing one step more we can say that from an orthogonal basis we can construct an orthonormal basis uh, through gram smith orthonormalization process we can construct orthonormal basis and in some case we use orthonormal basis consisting of eigen vectors as the case may be so another observation is the minimal polynomial of the graph is a product of linear factors okay that is immediate from this uh, result because if lambda 1 lambda 2 etc lambda t are k are t distinct eigen values with eigen vectors v1 v2 etc vt then yeah, and no, not only v1 there are plenty associated with the lambda 1 and plenty associated with see there are uh, or the or there are algebraic multiplicity number of eigen vectors associated with the lambda 1 and so on so m1 etc mg and these all together forms a basis for rn then if we consider the polynomial fx is equal to x minus lambda 1 into x minus lambda 2 into etc x minus lambda t this is a product of linear factors and f of a is equal to a minus lambda 1 i etc a minus lambda g i and you can see that this polynomial brings every element of the basis to zero because this polynomial will bring all these empty linearly independent vectors all these empty eigen vectors associated with the lambda g to zero when applied here and since a is symmetric this product commutes also so you can take any term any linear term at the end and operate with the desired collection of eigen vectors so that the minimal polynomial is a product of linear factors our discussions are based on connected graphs only this is because if you consider a uh, as we stated only earlier the characteristic polynomial the eigen values these are the main concern of our topic our discussion and if the if a graph is disconnected say with the two components then the adjacency matrix can be written as the adjacency matrix of the first component b 
zero and zero the adjacent symmetrics of the second component it is it is an elementary linear algebraic result that the characteristic polynomial of a is the product of the polynomial of this b and c so that the spectrum or the set of eigen values of a is the union of eigen values of b and c so the discussion pertaining to connected graph will suffice so we discuss results concerned with connected graphs only and for disconnected graph this can be extended component wise this is this can be considered as one of the very primary result sum of the eigen values of any graph is zero so this is because we already seen that the adjacency matrix capital a is similar to a diagonal matrix whose diagonal entries are eigen values and similar matrices have the same trace trace is the sum of the diagonal entries and for capital a the diagonal entries are a i i and all of them are zeros so trace of a is zero whereas trace of d is sum of lambda this the sum of these numbers lambda and lambda etc lambda n so the first result follows sigma lambda i equal to zero and the second one this is actually uh, some, something more uh, significant than the first one this gives a light to the structure of the graph the 2m m is the number of edges of a graph and that is a structure property of the graph whereas the left hand side is a purely an a linear algebra uh, term the sum of the sum of the squares of eigen values sum of the squares of eigen values depends or re, is related to the structure of the graph via sigma lambda i square is equal to twice the number of edges and this is also very trivial because we see already that uh, this is for for this purpose we proved the ij theory of a raised to k is the order number of va vj walks of length k now since a is similar to d we can see that a square is similar to d square so this is because uh, from the elementary definition of similarity of matrices a and b are similar means there is an invertible matrix capital x such that x is equal to a is equal to xd x inverse so that a square is equal to xd x inverse operated with xd x inverse x inverse x inverse get i so this is x d square x inverse so a square is similar to d square and d square is since d is a diagonal matrix the diagonal entries of d square elsewhere zeros are lambda 1 square lambda 2 square etc lambda n square and trace of a square what is trace of a square what is ij theory of a square ij theory of a square is the total number of vi vj walks of length 2 vi vj walks of length 2 sorry um ij theory of a square so what is the ii theory of a square ii theory of a square see that is only counted in the trace of a square ii theory of a square is the total number of vi vi walks of length k of length 2 i i theory of a square is the v i v i walk of length 2 now how a v i v i walk of length 2 arise the v i v i walk of length 2 arise only through an edge incident with v i so if there is an edge incident with v i then there is one v i v i walk of length 2 so how many edges are incident with v i that is degree of v i so how many v i v i walks of length 2 are there what is the degree of vi that much number of <coughs> vi vi walks of length 2 are there so the i i theory of a square is equal to degree of vi so trace of a square is the sum of those i i theories that is sigma d degree of vi and from the first theorem in graph theory sigma degree of vi is equal to trace the number of edges so exploring along this line gives you a relation between the eigen values of the graph and the structure of the graph So naturally, we ask for the, the 
third possibility sigma lambda q so the same argument follows a q b is similar to d q d q with the trace of d q is equal to <coughs> sigma lambda i q and on the other hand i i entry of a q i i entry of a q is the total number of v i v i walks of length 3 i i entry is v i v i walks of length 3 so how a v i v i walk of length 3 arises you can see that that can happen only through a triangle v i v j v k the yeah, vi vi walk of length 3 can arise only through a triangle in which vi lies see consider one triangle in which vi lies then we get see this is one vi vi walk vi vj vk and another one is uh, that we will get after reverse in the directions vi vk vj see this is another one and this is the first one So, a triangle in which VI lies gives rise to two VI VJ walks, two VI VI walks of length 3. See, but at the same time, this triangle will be counted two times when we consider the JJ entry and KK entry. So, altogether, a triangle will be counted six times. In case of VI, it will be counted two times and vj two times, vk two times. So altogether this triangle will be counted six times. So when we sum up the diagonal entries of aq, the result is 60. So this is, this is, uh, this can uh, be pursued further. This can be investigated further to get other relations. And this is, this sum of Hagen power of Hagen values are called the spectral moments. Spectral moments. And the first, second, third spectral moments are trivial, very trivial. And from fourth spectral moment onwards, there are problems. So because for the IA entry of R is to 4, the total number of VI, VI walks of length 4 can arise in several ways. with the help of a K12 incident with VI, we get a VI, VI walk of length 4. See. VI to VJ, VI to VJ, VJ to VI, VI to VK, VK to VI. That is one VI, VI walk of length 4. And if you traverse this VJ, VI, VJ four times, VI to VJ, VJ to VI, again VI to VJ, VJ to VI, we get a VI, VJ, VI, VI walk of length 4. And if there is a, a C4 in which VI lies, then also we get two VI, VI walks of length 4. So, when we consider sigma lambda I raised to 4, we should be more careful. We have to take into account more structure of the graph and as the number of vertices and number of edges increases an exact formula for sigma lambda i raised to 4 is difficult but if we restrict the graph such as it is a graph free from c4 or something like that we can have some estimates for this and this is an active area of research what are the spectral moments even though the exact values are not able to be computed what information this spectral moments gives about the structure of the graph is an interesting topic to study. Another structural relation is, or another structural property which we can deduce from the spectrum of the graph is, if G is a connected graph with the diameter D, then G has at least D plus one distinct eigenvalues. This is also See, the diameter is a graph property. Yeah. And the number of distinct eigenvalues is a linear algebraic property of the graph or a spectral property. 
or specifically that is a spectral property and this result results this result then connects the structural property the diameter with the spectral property of the graph see how we can see this if g is a graph with the diameter d then g has at least d plus one distinct eigen values so suppose the number of distinct eigen values is k and we need to show that k is greater than or equal to d plus 1 and assume for the time being that k is less than or equal to d so let lambda 1 lambda 2 etc lambda k be the k distinct eigen values and as we already seen the minimal polynomial is a product of linear factors so the minimal polynomial is of degree k so the minimal polynomial is something look like a raised to k for something etc plus a1 a plus a0 i equal to 0 okay a n a raised to k plus a n minus 1 a raised to k minus 1 plus etc a1 a plus a0 i equal to 0 because the minimal polynomial is of degree k product of k linear factors then we can see that this a raised to k can be expressed as a linear combination of i a a square etc a raised to k minus 1 if this a raised to k can be expressed as a linear combination of i a a square etc a raised to k minus 1 then any higher power a raised to t can be expressed as a linear combination of i a a square etc a raised to k minus 1 now it is given that the diameter of the graph is d so there exist two vertices u and v such that the distance between u and v is equal to d and there are no other path of shorter length than this d exists in g and this uv path of length d is a uv walk of length d uv walk of length d so the u v is the entry of a raised to d is non zero because the uv entry of a raised to d is the total number of u v walks of length d that is non zero and there are no u v walks of length d in there are no u v walks of length less than d in the graph g therefore a the u v entry of a raised to t equal to zero for all t less than d now this a raised to d can also be represented as a linear combination of i a a square etc a raised to k minus 1 a is less than or equal to d so k minus 1 is strictly less than d therefore the uv entry of all these matrices are zeros so the uv entry of the linear combination is also zero since since because the constituent matrices have its uv entry zero any linear combination of these matrix matrices also have the uv entry zero so the uv entry of a is to d must be zero and that is a contradiction so this k cannot be less than or equal to d k should be greater than or equal to d plus 1 and this is this is also an interesting a uh, problem to in, reinvestigate see given a graph with a diameter d can you characterize such graphs with exactly d plus 1 distinct eigen values see g has to d plus 1 eigen values so g cannot have fewer than d eigen value d it cannot have d or less a number of eigen values it have at least d plus 1 distinct eigen values then this is a, a research problem characterize those graphs with exactly d plus 1 eigen values and in fact characterizations are already done for d is equal to 1 d is equal to 1 the graph is complete and you can see that complete graph has exactly two distinct eigen values and when d is equal to 2 the diameter of two graphs complete that is a family of a strongly regular graph we can see that they have exactly three distinct eigen values and for some d particular d is equal to k 
can we characterize this is a problem can we characterize graphs with exactly k plus and distinct eigen values now we consider spectrum of some special matrices which we use later okay circulant matrix uh, and one of the most simple matrices associated with the graphs is a circulant matrix and circulant matrix is obtained from its first row alone from the first row if we simply make a push we get the second row see an then a1 a2 etc an minus 1 etc so how can we find the spectrum of this graph see actually the computation of spectrum is a is one of the most difficult problems in graph theory in algebra and even in computer science because the adjacency matrix associated with a graph with n vertices is an n by n determinant and the characteristic polynomial is determined by a minus lambda i and the characteristic equation is a minus lambda i equal to zero so in order to find the spectrum of a graph we have to expand this determinant and this is an n by n determinant and there is no easy way to expand an n by n determinant so suppose somehow we succeeded in expanding that then we are end up with an nth degree equation and in fact there are no easy way to solve an nth degree equation so always concentrate on some other techniques to find the spectrum of a graph and this is a this is actually in computer language this is a polynomially complex the complexity of this computation is large and uh, we cannot uh, in most cases we cannot solve an nth degree equation there are no easy way to solve an nth degree equation so we have to develop some other techniques to find the spectrum of a graph and we are lucky if we have a special kind of matrices We, if we have some matrices with a nice nature we can use some other linear algebraic techniques to find the spectrum and this circulant matrix is one of such matrices i suppose see if you take let it omega be the nth root of unity so that omega is to n equal to 1 if we if we take a, ve a vector v is equal to 1 omega omega square etc omega raised to n minus 1 then this is an n by 1 vector you operate with this 1 omega omega square etc omega raised to n minus 1 by a simple algebraic matrix manipulation we can see that this is equal to the first entry is a1 plus a2 omega plus a3 omega square plus etc plus an omega raised to n minus 1 second is an plus an plus a1 omega plus a2 omega square plus etc plus a n minus 1 omega raised to n minus 1 and so on and the last a2 plus a3 omega plus etc plus a1 omega raised to n minus 1 and you can see that if we call this as the lambda then the second entry is nothing other than lambda omega they multiply by omega a1 omega a2 omega square that comes here <coughs> and at last an minus 1 omega raised to n minus 2 term is there that multiplied with omega an minus 1 omega raised to n minus 1 and an omega raised to n minus 1 multiplied by omega is an because omega raised to n is 1 so this is lambda omega and the next term is then naturally lambda omega square etc the last term is lambda omega raised to n minus 1 and this is equal to lambda v so for a circulant matrix the eigen values lambda are given by <coughs> are given from the first row itself a1 plus a2 omega plus a3 omega square plus etc plus an omega raised to n minus 1 and this can be applied to get the spectrum of some well known graphs we consider cycle for the cycle v1 
on vertices v1 v2 etc bn so the, the shape of the graph itself is cycle and the circular and we can see that the corresponding adjacency matrix is circular with the first row zero one zero 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 etc last one and other rows are obtained by a simple push or simple jump of this first row that's a circular matrix because if we jump from v1 to v2 again this is symmetrical as we start from v1 we start from v2 like that so what is the spectrum of cn there is a collection of all numbers of the form 0 plus omega plus etc plus omega raised to n minus 1 so this is omega plus omega raised to n minus 1 where omega is an nth root of unity and you take see this is true for every nth root of unity so if you take the primitive nth root of unity as cos 2 pi r by n plus i sin 2 pi r n by n r equal to 0 1 2 3 etc n minus 1 and if you apply and apply de Moivre's law and simplify this you can see that the spectrum consists of 2 cos 2 pi r by n r equal to 0 1 2 3 etc n minus 1. This is the spectrum of the cycle. And the spectrum of Kn. So what is adjacent symmetry of Kn? The adjacent symmetry of Kn, you know, if you take V1, V1 is adjacent with all the remaining vertices. So the adjacent symmetry is, is circular with the first row, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 etc. And the second row also Second row is obtained by a push or V2. In V2, V2 is adjacent with all vertices except V1. Except in so this is circulant. So the spectrum of Kn consists of all numbers of the form 0 into 1, 1, 0 plus omega plus omega square plus omega cube plus etc plus omega raised to n minus 1. And you can see that so there are two kind of in the root of unity one is the real in the root of unity that is one and all others are the imaginary in the root of unity omegas given by cos 2 pi r by n r equal to 0 1 2 3 etc n minus 1 so if omega happens to be one then from here we get 1 plus 1 plus etc 1 n minus 1 times so this is n minus 1 and if omega is different from 1 then we have this is equal to minus 1 because 1 plus omega plus omega square plus etc plus omega raised to n minus 1 is the sum of geometric series that uh, on simplification gives 0. So omega plus omega square plus etc plus omega raised to n minus 1 is equal to minus 1. So n minus 1 is multiplicity is with multiplicity 1 and minus 1 is multi with multiplicity n minus 1. And similarly, the spectrum of the other two matrices, i, i identity matrix is circulant with the first row. 1, 0, 0, 0, etc. So the only eigenvalue is 1 with the multiplicity n. And for J, J is a matrix whose all entries are equal to 1. So the first row is 1, second row is all 1, etc. So that is circulant with the first row 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, etc. So the spectrum is the collection of all 1 plus omega plus omega square plus etc plus omega raised to n minus 1 where omega is an nth root of unity. If omega is 1, then this gives rise to n. If omega is different from 1, then this is 0. So the only non-zero eigenvalue of the all one matrix J is n. And this also we use later. Another structural property we can deduce from the spectrum of a graph is a graph G is bipartite if and only if its spectrum is symmetric above zero. So we have already a characterization of a bipartite graph. A graph is bipartite if and only if it has no own cycles. Here we can see that the graph is bipartite if and only if the spectrum is symmetric above zero. So what do, what do we mean by symmetric above zero? 
when you say that the spectrum is symmetric about zero if whenever lambda is an eigen value of g minus lambda is also an eigen value of g whenever lambda is an eigen value of g if minus lambda is also an eigen value of g we say the spectrum is symmetric about zero see the these kind of results these kind of questions can be asked to other classes of graphs also and actually that is the way of research if g see here g has a particular property that g is bipartite okay then that property is characterized in terms of the spectrum see you should see this result in that way g is bipartite g is not mere a bipartite graph g can be any graph with property particular property p then can we characterize such a graph with particular property p in terms of the spectrum so the, these problems can be asked suppose g is hamiltonian can we characterize hamiltonian graphs or can we have uh, some idea some information regarding the hamiltonian city of a graph in terms of the spectrum g is eulerian g is planar g is having a convex g is having a bridge all these can be asked and you have to use plenty of linear algebraic and graph theoretic tools to establish results and that is research so you should those who are those who want to do research or those who want to have problems in research think and hear these statements in that way not only not as a mere uh, theorem mere, mere results so critically see this critically i think if g is bipartite then the spectrum is symmetric about zero then what happens if g is having some other particular property if g is self complementary what can be or if g if g is a graph with minimum degree say this or g if g is a graph with the number of n vertices is this much number then how this thing get reflected into the spectrum these type of questions can be asked and addressing these problems addressing these questions is the essence of research and we we, we prove this this is very elementary so suppose first that g is bipartite g is bipartite what do you mean by g is bipartite the vertex set of g can be partitioned into two sets such so that edges are in between these two sets only there are no edges connecting vertices of v1 and no edges connecting vertices of v2 so the adjacency matrix of g can be written as the adjacency matrix is indexed by these vertices in v1 and v2 in between v1 there are no adjacencies so totally zero and in between v1 and v2 there are adjacencies we denote that adjacency relation by b then in between v2 and v1 we transpose works and between v2 there are no edges so the adjacency matrix of g will look like a block form of this type so row b b transpose so it is given so what we want to show is that the spectrum is symmetric about zero so suppose lambda be an eigen value of g then there is a non zero vector v such that there is a non zero vector say w such that a w is equal to lambda w see this w works on this 2 by 2 block matrix so w is of the form some uv so now a w equal to lambda w means this implies zero into u bv bv is equal to lambda u b transpose u is equal to b transpose u is equal to lambda v so we get these two equations now it is given that w is non zero 
then is w is non zero at least one of this u or v is non zero both cannot be zero so suppose u not equal to zero u is a non zero vector then you can uh, we consider a minus u v clearly this u v and minus u v are linearly independent u v and minus u v are linearly independent and this is equal to zero into minus u v v b transpose into minus u that is minus b transpose u and this is equal to in b v we have already have lambda u so this is lambda u and b transpose u is lambda v so this is minus lambda v so this is equal to you take minus lambda outside minus lambda minus u v so this is minus lambda w and this shows this see this is a and this is another one w dash this is minus lambda w. and this shows w dash is an eigen vector of a corresponding to minus lambda or minus lambda is an eigen value of capital a of the bipartite graph so if lambda is an eigen value then minus lambda is also an eigen value so the spectrum is symmetric with respect to zero and on the other way suppose the spectrum is symmetric with respect to zero that means whenever lambda belongs to spectrum of g <coughs> minus lambda also belongs to spectrum of g and we need to show that g is bipartite so in order to show that g is bipartite it's sufficient to show that g has no odd sites and as we discussed earlier see this sigma lambda i raised to k where k is odd is the total number of vi vi walks of odd length sigma lambda i raised to k is the total number of vi vi walks of odd length if k is odd odd length to k but what is this we know that whenever a lambda raised to k appear in this sum there is a minus lambda raised to k appear because whenever lambda is an eigen value minus lambda is also an eigen value so these two terms cancel each other so that their sum is equal to zero so the contribution of this sum is zero therefore the total number of vi vi walks of odd length equal to zero we know that an odd, suppose there is an odd cycle an odd cycle is an is a walk of odd length the total number of vi vi walks of odd length is zero means there are no vi vi odd cycles so the total number of odd cycles in the graph is zero or the graph is free from odd cycles therefore the graph is bipartite so this is how Uh, the spectral tools are used to find used to establish some results g is bipartite if and only if the spectrum is symmetric with respect to zero and now and this is the classical perron fermenius theorem for a kerrler graph see this is the theorem if g is a connected kerrler graph then the all one vector is an eigen vector corresponding to k and for a connected kerrler graph this k is a simple root <coughs> of the characteristic polynomial or the algebraic multiplicity of the eigen value k is 1 so that can be proved by showing that the dimension of the eigen space of k is 1 and if lambda is any other eigen value of g then lambda lies in the interval minus k k so we show one by one this is simple to show
what is the first observation if g is square regular suppose g is square regular this g is square regular see consider any row vi is adjacent with k vertices so there will be k ones k ones in each row k ones so if we multiply this with the all one vector 1 1 1 1 etc we can see that this is first row into this is the first row sum so the first row sum is k second row sum is k etc k so this is k into 1 1 1 1 etc so a into j j is the all one n by 1 column matrix is equal to k j n by 1 therefore for a regular graph g with regularity k the regularity k itself is an eigen value and now we can show that the dimension of the eigen space associated with k is 1 we can show that k is a symbol k is a symbol means a symbol means the number of occurrence of k as an eigen value is 1 we, we can prove that by proving that the dimension of the eigen space or the number of linearly independent eigen vectors associated with the k is j is 1 uh, all other eigen vectors are multiples of this j you do that like this see suppose x is equal to x1 x2 etc xn be any other eigen vector of k any other eigen vector corresponding to this k then without loss of generality we assume that at least one entry of this x is positive because if all entries of x is negative we take minus x instead of x so at least one of these entries is positive and let x i be x j be the largest entry x j be the last largest entry and we know that now a x is equal to k x because x is an eigen vector corresponding to k so suppose v j1 v j2 etc v j k be the k vertices adjacent with v j so expanding this along the j row only for those vertices the corresponding entries x j1 x j2 etc x j k need to be counted because for all others a i j equal to zero so the only non zero row entries in capital a are a j1 a j2 etc a j k because b j1 is adjacent to b j b j2 is adjacent to b j etc so expanding along the j row we get x j1 plus x j2 plus etc plus x j k is equal to k x j and x j is the largest entry so all these x j i's are less than or equal to x j now none of them can be less than x j because if one of them is less than x j then to keep the sum of these k numbers as k x j some other entry will be greater than x j and that is impossible and the none of the entries is greater than x j by the same reason so all these entries x j1 equal to x j2 equal to etc all these entries should be equal equal to x j so now in this cap in this eigen vector x we get the several largest entries now we we we, we apply the same argument to these entries we can show that this cap this eigen vector x is nothing other than x j x j etc x j so that is it is a scalar multiple of the all one vector it is a multiple of xj so 
there is only one linearly independent eigen vector this all one vector is already an eigen vector associated with a and all other eigen vectors are scalar multiples of this therefore all these are linearly dependent so the dimension of the eigen space associated with the k is 1 okay so the all the geometric multiplicity of the geometric multiplicity of the eigen value k that is 1 so by our last result algebraic multiplicity equal to geometric multiplicity k is a simple eigen value of the graph g and this result is of profound significance uh, in our later discussions and by a similar argument we can show that if lambda is any other eigen value of b then minus k less than or equal to lambda less than or equal to k by showing that modulus of lambda less than or equal to k so that is also a simple argument like this, this by taking a an eigen vector corresponding to lambda and with the largest absolute value we can show that so the see what is that what is the advantage of this peron schrodinger's theorem for a k regular graph see if g is k regular then we need not go beyond the closed interval minus k k to find the spectrum of g the spectrum of g is fully contained in this closed interval minus k k and even it attains its supremum k so then this is a a a a a research problem so given some particular k can we characterize those graphs whose spectrum lying in between those k those minus k and k in the closed interval minus k k and the same can be asked for irregular graphs also so the treatment of irregular graph is little more difficult than regular graphs that that also we will see during our discussion if we have a time for discussion for that also so the same question can be asked in case of irregular graph also what can we say about what information we can have about the spectrum of an irregular graph or a semi regular graph do the spectrum reaches at a more simpler level than an irregular graph yes, of course because there are only two type vertices of degree as a s and t those vertices with s and those vertices with degree t so these type questions can be asked and there are several results concerned with uh, spectrum of irregular graph also and another important result regarding the spectrum of graph is the hoffman polynomial theorem suppose g is a k regular connected graph on n vertices and this this result uses the results we have discussed so far suppose g is a k regular and connected graph on n vertices first i say what is this adjacency algebra Okay. Suppose A is the adjacency matrix of G, and the collection of all polynomials f of A, where f x is a polynomial with real entries, the collection of all matrices of the form f of A constitute the adjacency algebra of G. So it is a polynomial in X with the real entries, then f of A. Yeah, there is an infinite number of such matrices because there are an infinite number of polynomials the collection of all such polynomials is known as the adjacency algebra of g and hoffman polynomial theorem states that a graph g is regular and connected if and only if j the all one matrix of order n is in the adjacency algebra of g so that is for some polynomial fx f of a is equal to j i hope this is clear adjacency algebra of g is a collection of all polynomials of the form f of a so j is a member of this adjacency algebra means 
there is some polynomial effects such that f of a is equal to j. Okay, so we assume first that j is in the adjacency algebra. So suppose j belongs to the adjacency algebra of G. What to show is J, J is G is regular and connected. So first we prove G is regular. See how can we show that a graph is regular? We consider the adjacency matrix. If each row sums to a constant say K, if the sum of each row is k, then we can see that there are k ones in each rows, so that each vertex is adjacent with k other vertices, so that the graph is regular. So to show that the graph is regular, it is sufficient to show that each row sums to a constant. So now we consider a j. What is a j actually? In the computation of a j, we are computing the first row sum when we multiply a with the first column of j. If we multiply the first row of a with the first column of j, what we are getting is the first row sum. Second row, first column is the second row sum and so on. Now aj is a f a. Since j is in the adjacency algebra, there is a polynomial f x such that j is equal to f of a. <coughs> now since a is symmetric this a and f a commutes so this is f of a a f of a is j j so this is the same as 1 1 1 1 etc a so what is the first row sum first row sum First row, first column of J, that is the first row sum. That is equal to first row of J with the first column of A. That is the first column sum of A. That is C1. Second row sum R2 is equal to the second row sum. Second row of J with the first column of A. That is again first column sum, that is C1. Similarly, R3 is equal to C1, etc. Rn equal to C1. That means each row sums to the same constant C1. So the graph is regular. If C1 is k, then the graph is k regular. And the graph is connected also. So assume the graph is disconnected. What happens in a disconnected graph? See, assume that G is disconnected. Here we want to show that the graph is connected. If it is disconnected, see, take two vertices, u and v, from two different components. Then there exists no uv walk of any length. No uv walks of any length. So if we take the ijth entry of any power of a, the ijth entry of a is to k, I did not I did entry. The UV entry of R is to K is zero for all K. K equal to 1, 2, 3, etc. See, if the UV entry of R is to K equal to zero for all K, then the UV entry in any polynomial in A is also zero. UV entry of R is to K is zero for all K. So you consider any polynomial. Any polynomial is a linear combination of powers of A. In those powers, the unit entry is zero. So the unit entry of the polynomial is also zero. But there is a polynomial J, which is equal to F of A. So the unit entry of J is also zero. And that is impossible. Therefore, G cannot be disconnected. Therefore, G should be necessarily connected. And on the other way, assume that G is K regular and connected. 
each column of ga is an eigen vector of a corresponding to k so because when we multiply this a with the first column we get the first column of i multiplied by k a sorry a this is ga k ga this is ga sorry so when we multiply the first row first column of ga with a we get k into first column of ga so a into first column of ga is equal to k into first column of ga so each row each column is each column is an eigen vector of a corresponding to k and by parent fermion theorem we know that any eigen vector of a corresponding to k is a scalar multiple of the all one vector therefore the columns of ga are some c1 j n by 1 c2 j n by 1 etc c n j n by 1 so ga will look like ga will look like c1 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 etc c1 c2 c2 etc c2 etc cn cn etc cn but a is symmetric therefore ga is also symmetric so the first row coincides with the first column therefore every ci is r equal therefore c1 equal to c2 equal to etc equal to cn equal to c1 or let it be c so all the entries of this ga so ga is equal to c c c c c etc so this is c1 1 etc 1 so this is cj what was gx so there exists a polynomial gx is such that gx is equal to x minus lambda 2 into etc x minus lambda g such that g of a is equal to cj or 1 by c ga is equal to j so there is a polynomial say hx such that ha of ha is equal to j where hx is equal to x minus lambda 2 into etc x minus lambda t by c now how to find see this is the hoffman polynomial theorem there exists a polynomial there exists a polynomial hx such that ha is equal to j and what in fact this polynomial is so what is h of a h of a is equal to a minus lambda 1 i into etc a minus lambda ti a x is equal to x minus lambda 2 into x minus lambda 3 into etc x minus lambda t by c and this is equal to j
now h of a is equal to a minus lambda 2i into etc a minus lambda t i by c that is equal to j this is not j h i is equal to j since, since this is a polynomial in a corresponding to every eigenvalue lambda of a h lambda is an eigenvalue of this expression now we can see that the see the eigenvalues of a are k lambda 2 etc lambda t and corresponding to lambda 2 h lambda 2 h lambda 2 is zero h lambda 3 is zero etc h lambda t equal to zero because of this these type of factors so corresponding to these eigenvalues we get only zero eigenvalue of h of a or that of j and corresponding to the eigenvalue k of a hk is a non-zero eigenvalue hk is equal to k minus lambda 2 into etc k minus lambda t by c and this is in fact the non-zero eigenvalue of j see when we discuss the circulant matrices we have we proved that n is the only non-zero eigenvalue of j therefore we get to see as k minus lambda 2, k minus lambda 3, etc., k minus lambda t by n. So, specifically or particularly, hx is then equal to, hx is equal to, hx is equal to x minus lambda 2 into etc., x minus lambda t by n by c. And c is k minus lambda 2 k minus lambda 3, etc., k minus lambda t by n. So, this is n. So, we showed that the Hoffman polynomial P, this hx, here in the theorem it is uh, notated as P. Okay, I told it maybe. Uh, the Hoffman polynomial hx satisfies the condition that h of a is equal to j. So, when we uh, see the advantage of this can be seen when we expand the characteristic polynomial and we see that the j factor appears there. And that j factor can be replaced by a polynomial in A. That is the advantage of Hoffman polynomial theorem. And in addition to that, hk, what is hk? hk is equal to n because n into k minus lambda to k minus lambda t by this, this two cancels and hk is equal to n. And h lambda equal to zero for any other eigenvalue lambda different from k of g. And this is the Hoffman polynomial. See, this, this technique, this Hoffman polynomial technique, uh, this result can be you can be uh, effectively utilized to find the spectrum of some, uh, some classes of graphs. See, one of such classes is, suppose g is a regular graph. Suppose G is k regular with adjacent symmetric capital A. Then what is the spectrum of, suppose the spectrum of G is not, can we find the spectrum of its complement? The complement has adjacent symmetric A complement. A complement is the adjacent symmetric of G complement. And we know that two vertices in G complement are adjacent if and only if the corresponding terms are not adjacent in G. So whenever Aij equal to zero in G, the adjacency matrix of G, Aij equal to one in A complement if Aij equal to zero in A and vice versa. And the diagonal entries are zeros. So we can see that the adjacency matrix of G complement is something like J minus I minus A. And this J can be replaced by a polynomial in A minus I minus A. And this is a polynomial in A and Hoffman polynomial theorem can be applied. Corresponding to the regularity K, we get PK, PK is equal to N. N minus 1 minus K is an eigenvalue. And for uh, K different from that, 
e lambda equal to zero for any other eigen value this term is zero and the only contribution is minus one minus lambda i think i i took 15 minutes more sorry i thought uh, that uh, i can extend up to 5:30 that is why okay yes sorry i am sorry for the inconvenience uh, so let us stop here and there are many more things to be explored which uses some linear algebraic techniques to explore the spectrum of graphs okay thank you if i have any questions you can ask so we will continue on 17th as already announced okay okay right, 17th what time sir uh, 3:30 or uh, the morning session will be appreciated sir okay sir um, sir for a incidence uh, matrix can we apply all these techniques for uh, incidence matrices yes, sir the problem is uh, for an incidence matrix the incidence matrix is not a symmetric matrix okay yeah okay. and that is a p by q matrix if the graph has p vertices and q edges okay and the incidence matrix theory uh, uses the singular values of the matrix okay so instead of eigen values we cannot find the eigen values of the incidence matrix right. so if so if capital i is the incident matrix then instead of the eigen values we use the singular values of i Uh, which are the eigen values of the matrix i i transpose okay that will be a p by p uh, matrix right. and and also the singular values of i transpose i if i is the incidence matrix okay. and the spectral theory along that line can be can be developed and also it has already developed and further research can be done uh, by replacing this adjacency matrix with the incidence matrix yes. any questions any other questions okay sir can you suggest some reference books for further reading yes yes okay. yes okay so, yeah, i think i can give that to the towards the end of the next session uh, otherwise you you read the spectra of graphs book by chetovic uh, dubs sash sashes and dubs and eigen spaces by the same authors spectra of graphs by william hamers and more than these textbooks there are plenty of papers available in the repositories in several repositories dealing with one aspect or other of the spectra of graphs can you give some motivation for this study uh, motivation you mean the applications i think Yes. Uh, see, there are plenty and plenty of applications 